Cartel Wives, Chapter 8. Why wait? Let's get after it. Middlemen. Middlemen. Chapter 6. Olivia. In wow. January 2004, Junior and I decided to move to San Juan to be close to his family. That's where his parents were from and now lived, and it was where Adrian had settled with his girlfriend, Daniela, after he'd been deported. Mountains cut through San Juan, some of them really rugged and tall. And in other spots, there are mesas with steep cliffs and dry valleys. It's pretty much what you imagine rural Mexico to look like, and personally, I thought it was dramatic, gorgeous, and exactly the place I wanted to start a new beginning with Junior. For the first time in years, I didn't feel the weight of the past or fear for our future. Mexico was a place where I could truly change my life, where Junior could change his life. The only concern weighing on me was Xavier, who was now a teenager. I don't think he'll want to move here, I said to Junior. We had always looked out for Xavier's best interests. I wanted to protect him, and so did Junior. Junior responded, We have to put Xavier's education first. He won't get a great education in a town like this. So let him finish out the school year, and then we'll move to Guadalajara, where there's an American school. It's excellent, and I'm sure he'll love living in the city. Plus, it'll give you enough time to make everything perfect for him. When Junior said things like that, it melted my heart. Most men I knew were selfish and didn't really care about another man's son. But not Junior. He treated Xavier like his own. Xavier had had a complicated life with all I'd put him through. He'd been there when the feds dragged my first husband to prison, and he was there when they lowered my second husband into the ground. The last thing I ever wanted was for my choices to affect my son, but I knew they had. I had a hard time forgiving myself for it. Xavier deserved better and I worried that if I carted him off to a small town in Mexico, he'd detach emotionally and resent me. In my heart, I knew Chicago was the best place for him, and leaving would just crush him. He loved his school and his friends. He loved doing normal things like going to the movies, spending weekends at Dave and Buster's, hanging out at Millennium Park, bowling, or walking down Michigan Avenue. It sounds like that boy ain't going to Mexico. Sounds like he's going to stay in Chicago. Before Christmas, he'd literally count the days till he could go see the big Christmas tree downtown, something my sister and I had always done with our parents. He adored my mom and dad, and living with them, he'd have the stability I wanted so much for him. He was enrolled at one of the best private schools in Chicago, had made the honor roll, played sports throughout the year, and truly made all of us proud. I just couldn't make him leave all of that. Besides, I didn't want him to be exposed to Junior's work. I just need a little more time to convince Junior to change and get out of this business, Stop I told it. myself. And it'll be easy now that we're here to Stop. stay. When that happens, I'll be the luckiest woman in the world with the man of my dreams and my son. Listen, there was no get out of the business. There was no get out of the business. You knew that. It was just getting deeper in the business. The baby was staying home so that y'all can go to Mexico and get deeper in the business. That was that was there was money happening right there. That wasn't gonna that wasn't going down like that. I knew I deserved to be happy too. I could be wrong, but stop the whole I was gonna convince him to do right. No, you love the game. You both love the game. In exchange for what, though? Get out of that business in exchange for what? Like, what was gonna, what was gonna replace that? I knew I deserved to be happy too. I was young, and I didn't want to grow old alone. I wanted to be happily married like my parents and grandparents, and I'd have that with Junior. We were destined to be together. It was like we shared the same heart. Leaving Xavier was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I knew it wouldn't be easy living without him, so I made a plan. I was still producing records, so I decided to schedule work trips to Chicago every two weeks. It was a lot on me, but when I saw Xavier, 
It was like all my Christmases came at once, and I showered him with gifts and tons of affection. When I left, I felt so guilty. But I told myself this would only go on for six more months. Then I'd mark my calendar for his school breaks when he'd fly to Mexico to spend holidays with us as a family. In Chicago, he seemed happy. And that was all that mattered. He was at home. And now that I was in San Juan, I had to make it feel like home too. The town had practically nothing in it. About 10,000 people lived there, and there were only a few local restaurants and some taco stands situated on the corners in town. There was no supermarket, just a few little fruit stalls, and you'd have to drive two hours to get to Burger King or Costco. It was in the middle of nowhere, but it was beautiful. There was a mountain nearby with a statue of the Virgin Mary on top. In Spanish, they call that a santuario, and Junior and I would walk there every day and just sit and talk. At night, there was nowhere to go out, so we'd play charades or cards and tell stories with his family. My future father-in-law, who we all called Señor, had moved back to San Juan in the early 1990s when he was on the run. He and my future mother-in-law lived in a pueblo just outside of town, and he was doing the day-to-day -day things retired guys do. He was so into betting on the cockfights that he flew in his own roosters, thinking they were stronger than the ones you could find locally. He went into town every single day to bet on the horses. And when he wasn't eating his wife's delicious cooking or hanging out with whatever kid or grandkid was there visiting, he was waiting for money from Peter and Junior to show up. They supported him because, in the old country, that's what you were supposed to do. Senor was completely different than my sweet dad, but I clicked instantly with him. Yeah, he, was, he wasn't no copper, he was a super gangster. He was very macho, very Mexican, and thought that women should stay home, have kids, and never work. He'd sure found the right wife for that, too. I Sounds loved like Junior's it. mother, but she was the polar opposite of my firecracker mom. She obeyed her husband, raised seven kids, and lived for him. I'd always take her places and spend quality time with her, and I think she liked going with me mainly because it got her out of the house. Plus, I was missing my mom, so I appreciated being with her. You should have as many wives as you can afford, Junior's dad used to say to his sons. American girls are offended by statements like that, and I was no exception. I called him out. Who do you think you are treating a woman like that? He wasn't used to a strong, opinionated woman. You could have got yourself whacked by the father-in-law. So he'd smile and smirk. I entertained him and made him laugh. That smile and smirk was, boy, if my son didn't love you, boy, I smoked the shit out of you. <laughs> he enjoyed having real conversations, even though we'd get into these heated debates that I'd never back down from. He started to respect me because of it, and I felt the same. He was such an authority figure in his family, always preaching about not doing drugs or drinking. He'd say, smoking will kill you if anyone around him dared to light up a cigarette. You'd think that would make him some kind of saint? But this was the man who introduced his kids to the drug trade. He was a bundle of contradictions. Junior's older brother Adrian and his girlfriend Daniela were more my speed. They were funny and outgoing, and like me and Junior, inseparable. Adrian was a Latin king back in the day and ran with Kay, who'd been one of his best friends. In fact, he was a drug dealer and he'd introduced Kay to hustling. I'd never met him, though because in 1998 he'd gone to prison for drug conspiracy and was there the whole time Kay and I were married. Guess who was his cellmate in prison? My ex-husband, Leo. Chicago was a small town, especially if you knew the money makers like we did. Daniela became a sister to me almost immediately because she was sweet and protective, like my own sister. She and Adrian were instantly welcoming making us feel right at home. They're a big reason I wanted to stay. I missed my family, and they stepped up and created one for me from the moment we got there. Family really was everything to Adrian. 
He's 15 years older than Peter and Junior, and when the twins were born, their dad was in prison. Adrian stepped in and basically raised them. He sold drugs to provide for the family, but he was insistent that his little brothers not get into the kind of trouble he was always in. He had them on a curfew when they were old enough to leave the house, and he did everything he could so they wouldn't join the Latin kings. He'd constantly point to gang members and say, look at them, they're losers, you're better than that. He wanted the best for them, so he made sure they kept their grades up, taught them responsibility, and when they started working at McDonald's, Adrian matched their paychecks, dollar for dollar. Like their dad, though, he was full of contradictions. One day, he asked Junior to retrieve the keys from the trunk of his car. Junior walked out, came right back, and said, Adrian, there are no keys there. His older brother's face dropped, and he ran outside with Junior, popped open the trunk, and grabbed 10 kilos of cocaine from inside it. They're right here, Junior, he said. Mm. Let this be a lesson to you. Not only do you have to be book smart, you need to be street smart too. Adrian honestly wanted to keep Peter and Junior away from the bullshit, but he couldn't. It was a family thing. When Adrian went to prison when they were 17, he made them too smart for the streets. Most drug dealers work in quarter kilos or ounces, but Junior and Pete's first deal at age 17 was for 30 kilos. They made their first million at 18. By 20, Junior was flying to Culiacan to negotiate prices. In my mind, though, the past was the past. We were building a new future, and Junior was making me the happiest I'd ever been in my life. Right, he, he wasn't that busy, game. so it was just him and me, with no distractions. Even though we spent every moment together, I still couldn't get enough of him. All I wanted to do was make love to him, and when I did, my love for him grew deeper. Everything around me was new and exciting. When I arrived, the entire town was throwing a three-week festival called the Feria. There were cockfights and carnival rides, and bands following us around playing music. People partied every night for three weeks straight, and if your family lived in the United States, they'd flown back to enjoy it all. I remember thinking, I can get used to this. This is my home now, and this is my family. I don't mind if we're in the middle of nowhere. We can live a simple life here. Mia. When I dropped Peter off that morning in February 2004, I had no idea he was planning to leave the country. At that moment, I don't think even he knew. But when the DEA agents ransacked his house, Junior's house and his sister's houses, he learned that he and Junior were officially under indictment. Fleeing was the only choice he had other than prison. My first night alone, I didn't do anything. I just sat in my big, empty condo, staring way up at the ceiling, thinking to myself, I've never been so lonely. I might as well just curl up and die here. Oh, Sahira. The next morning, I packed up my things and drove to my parents' house. When my mom saw me at the door, looking like I'd been run over by a car, she let me in and wrapped her arms around me. Baby, what's wrong? Peter and I broke up. I didn't reveal why. I just couldn't. I was too scared to tell her. For the next two weeks, my mom sat with me probably five hours a day trying to console me. When she wasn't watching me sulk, she was cooking up one of my favorite dishes. At night, she got in the bed with me and didn't leave till I'd fallen asleep. Even though my mother is the toughest woman I've ever met, Spoiled. she had the softest heart for me. During those two weeks, she became more than just my mother. She started to speak to me like a friend. You are a strong, beautiful, smart woman. You'll get through this, no se pendeja. she'd say. I don't know if I can. My mom probably thought I was just being some dramatic 20-something, but honestly, I felt like I was going to be swallowed up by worry and pain. Sure, I had a home and an amazing family, and Peter had left me some money so I could open up the spa we'd started planning. 
We were going to run it together, and I didn't know if I could do it without him. I felt totally, completely alone, and Peter could be dead for all I knew. On day 14, he finally called. Peter, where are you? Are you okay? I was in shock. Mia, you saved my life. If I'd been at my house, the feds would have gotten me. I would have spent the rest of my life in prison. Thank you. I can't thank you enough. But where are you? I'm almost to Mexico. I could tell he was driving. I can't lose you again, Mia. I love you. What Peter didn't tell me was that he and Junior were now officially under federal indictment, so he'd taken a huge risk by calling me. After he'd said goodbye to me, he'd gone into hiding at a friend's stash house in the projects. While he was there, he'd been so worried about the feds kicking in his door or someone trying to stick him up, and the neighborhood was known for home invasions. He'd switched out all his phones, collected $15 million from his customers on the streets, and paid his suppliers for the 400 kilos that was seized from their warehouse by the DEA. The last thing he was going to do was leave business undone. He bought a brand new van with Indiana plates and cut up his IDs. Two weeks later, he got on the road to head to the border at Laredo. Hmm. Worried that the feds had tapped his phones, he couldn't call me right away. He switched cars several times and looked in his rearview mirror every 30 seconds to be sure no one was tailing him. Mia, he said, when I get to Mexico, I have to stay there. I can't come back to Chicago. I got really quiet. I didn't just think he was leaving me forever. I was also worried about him getting to Mexico safely. He was my best friend. I want you to come down here, he said. I want to make a life with you. I was half puzzled, half in shock. Peter, I said, I love you, but my parents aren't going to understand. He was steady and firm. I miss you, and I want to be with you. But the only way we can have a relationship is if you're with me, because I can't go back. I felt conflicted. I couldn't imagine leaving everything I'd ever known. But I also couldn't imagine letting the man of my dreams slip away. Gotta go. If you don't want to do this, Peter continued, I understand. You can still go to school. I still want you to open your spot, too. I believe in you, and I know you can do it. Then he stopped and got super serious. But if you want a relationship with me, I can't give you that from here. The decision was all mine, it seemed, and it was a lot to ask of a 22-year-old girl who'd just spent two weeks curled up in a ball in her childhood bedroom. Now think about it. She cut ties right there. No, Peter, I can't. You, you're on the run. What kind of life is that for me to go to Mexico? I'm not going. Would she have saved herself a lot of grief? She wouldn't have the family that she has specifically today. She wouldn't have the life that she has specifically today. Could it have been worse? Possibly. She could have ended up with a loser that beat her to death and killed her or something like that. You know what I'm saying? But I say all that to say this moment right here is a crossroads for her. Because at this moment, she could change her mind and it changes everything going forward in, in, in the universe. You know what I'm saying? For them as a family. But if I had to make up my mind, I would. Just not yet. Olivia. That February, Junior and I decided to go to Cancun to celebrate Valentine's Day. Adrian and Daniela came too. And because Daniela's brother and his wife were in town, we said, what the hell? Let's make it a family vacation. I was completely happy there. I loved the freedom. And I loved the tranquil life Mexico brought. It was me, my man, the beach, and family, and none of us were looking over our shoulders worrying that someone was out to kill us. One night, I had a frozen margarita in my hand and was watching the sunset with Junior when his phone rang. It was Peter. I can just hear him now, I thought. When are you going to stop honeymooning and start working? Mm. Hi, Pete, what's up? Junior asked. There was a long pause and he screwed on his worried face. 
what's going on? I yelled. That look in his eyes was giving me the chills. Junior motioned for me to calm down, talked for about five minutes, then hung up. Pete's house got raided, mine too, and our sister's places all at the same damn time. They took everything, jewelry, cars, the whole bit. They're so petty they even took the damn TVs off the wall. If Peter hadn't been at Mia's place, they would have taken him too. Jesus. I sat back in my beach chair and started to- It's hilarious though, all that drama. He's like, yo, when you gonna stop honeymooning and get your ass back to work? And then he tells her, they raided everything, they took everything, they almost got Peter. She said, I was sitting in my beach chair. <laughs> I sat back in my beach chair and started to feel sick. I couldn't believe my dreams were crushed with just one phone call. The feds have a warrant out for our arrest, and Peter's hiding out. He's moving down here once he gets everything together and figures out a plan. We have to get the hell out of Cancun, too. Too many people know we're here. He hopped up, and I just sat there holding my melted drink. My life is fucking cursed, I thought. I told myself- Her melted drink with the umbrella in, it, in her beach chair. Her cursed life. If we'd gotten away. That we could actually start over, far no. from all the drama I was so tired of. No. But who was I kidding? You loved the I game. I was in this relationship for the long haul. Yes, you were. Junior was my world. Yes, He'd he given was. up his life in Chicago to make me happy. And I couldn't forget that, even now in the midst of all this bullshit. When we got back to the hotel, Junior hopped on the phone immediately and paid someone to create two Mexican passports for him and Peter. Hmm. When you're a fugitive, you have to get a new identity, and in Mexico, you can buy just about anything. Junior and Peter became Joel and Omar. We left Cancun the next morning, expecting Peter would be calling soon to get picked up at the border. We spent the trip to the airport getting our story straight in case we got stopped. We didn't want to attract attention at the airport either, so we dressed down. Muted colors, no fancy jewelry, and no expensive luggage. In fact, we'd gifted our Louis Vuitton bags to the bellboy at the hotel on the way out. He was thrilled, and so was Junior. He loved making people smile. As we approached airport security, my heart was pounding, but we made it through. When we got on the plane, Junior ordered a drink, turned to me and said, my brother's on his way to the border now, and I know he's thinking the same thing I am. What's that? I asked, even though my stomach was in knots because I already knew the answer. I hope they don't grab us and put us in prison for the rest of our lives. Mm. We have to get to San Juan safely. Peter called a few weeks later, and we met him at the border. The drive back was over 12 hours through the Sierra, and as I looked out the window, I was nauseated the entire time. Whether that was from the long trip or from knowing Peter and Junior were now fugitives, I couldn't say. But Mexico didn't seem so peaceful anymore. The beautiful scenery now just looked dry. The long stretches of desert used to be pretty, and now they looked like shit. I kept thinking. Now that his brother is here, there's no way he's giving up this life even though we moved here to get away from the bullshit. It's going to take a miracle to make him stop dealing drugs with his partner in crime around. Every time I take a step in a new- That sounds like she wanted to keep them apart. That sounds like she was straight straight with staying in Mexico and Buddy staying in the US. I guess she she had ideas of, of, of getting out the business, but I don't believe it. I don't believe it. There is no get out the business, not at that point. Direction to get away from this craziness. I take two steps back. Peter interrupted my daydreaming. This is the first time in weeks I haven't felt terrified, he said. I want things to get even better, so I'm trying to get Mia to move here. I'm in love with her. She saved me. Go with your heart, Junior said. You deserve to be happy. I remembered meeting Mia in Chicago just once. She was this pretty Brazilian girl with blonde hair and green eyes. She was petite with a nice body, really soft spoken and sweet. She was a few years younger than me, and I could tell she was good people. She was different than me though. I had never really cared to hang out with women, and she was such a girl's girl. 
So traditional? Not that that's a bad thing. It was just not me. If she came down, was I going to be able to get along with someone like that? Actually, was she going to be able to get along with someone like me? Mia. I honestly didn't know what to decide about moving to Mexico, to a whole new country. My life had never been about having choices. Not because I was a blind follower, but because I thought I had my life all figured out. Anything out of my narrow frame of reference felt really strange and scary. What was there in Mexico for me other than Peter? I had no idea. I'd known Peter's mom, Amelia, since I was 16. He was absolutely wonderful to her. He'd take her everywhere, even to the movies or out to eat with us. I liked her. She was so sweet, had a smile that was contagious and was always happy to be around her sons. I also knew his brother Adrian, who was a drug dealer and had that fleet of cars that he was always getting detailed. Every time I passed by the car wash, there was one of Adrian's cars sitting in front. And of course, there was Junior. I hardly knew Junior's girlfriend, though. We'd met once, and all I remember was that she was loud, with lots of diamond jewelry and this crazy body. She was pretty, but she looked like she was from a music video. I remember thinking, this girl has seen a lot. I could just imagine them reading each other's part in the book like, what are you talking about? You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, they sound extremely different. I moved down there and started spending time with her. Was she going to leave me in the dust? My grandma Lola was really sick at the time, in and out of the hospital. She was my mom's mom, who'd taken care of me as a baby when mom was working and my biological dad bailed. I was her first grandchild, and I'd always been her everything. When I was a baby, I had huge green eyes, so she nicknamed me. Corujinha, which means baby owl in Portuguese. She loved to play bingo, listen to Julio Iglesias, and eat rice and beans every day. Not a day went by that she didn't tell me, you're too skinny, eat, eat, eat. I loved touching her soft, wrinkly hands, and I loved that she was never embarrassed to speak English, even though she had an accent so thick most people couldn't understand her. I can't leave her. I kept telling myself, I love her too much. But when Peter called a few days later to ask me what I wanted to do, the first thing out of my mouth was, yes. I didn't even hesitate. I think that's part of being young. You don't think things through before you act. And believe me, while I might have let questions enter my mind, I didn't seriously consider them. I just jumped. My parents were so skeptical. That's a nice way to put it. They were in complete disbelief. His family owns a bunch of real estate down there, I told him, and they're going to develop homes in gated communities. Salah. That family is bad news, mm. Dad said. They aren't anymore, I pleaded. People change, Dad. Mm -mm. Mom didn't believe me. Two weeks ago, I was practically spoon-feeding you because he left you, and now you're moving to Mexico with him? My dad didn't say much after that. He just looked depressed. What's he gonna say? His dream had always been for me to live next door to them when I got married, and he'd even talked about building an extension onto their house for me. Moving to Mexico had sure as hell never figured into that plan. But they came around, finally. I suppose they just trusted me, thinking that I must know what was best for me, since I'd never really gotten it wrong before. Call us every chance you get, they said when I started packing up. And if you change your mind, just come back home. I went to see my grandma in the hospital the night before I left. She wasn't looking so good. Skinny, with circles under her eyes and a sense of resignation maybe defeat, that I'd never seen come from a strong lady like her. It broke my heart. Grandma, I said, I'm going to Mexico tomorrow, but I'll be back to see you soon. Have a nice time, she said, 
and reached for me with her wrinkly hand. I never go to Mexico, but I always want to. Oh, Grandma, I said through tears. Don't worry, I'm going to take you there. Don't worry, Grandma. I never saw her again. I got on a flight the next day, and four days later, I got a call that she'd passed away. My grandma never made it out of the hospital, much less to Mexico. Olivia. When Peter came to San Juan, we were together all the time because I was always with Junior. I think he thought I was like this Yoko Ono figure coming into his little world because he and I started bickering constantly. My brother is such a good man. Why the hell are you so controlling, Peter would yell. I'd shoot back. You knew me when I was Kay's doormat. I'm not the same girl anymore. I'd vowed never to let anyone treat me like shit again. People treat you how you allow them to, so I felt perfectly comfortable being as strong as I wanted to be. Junior appreciated that, and he loved the confident woman I'd become. He respected me and needed someone like me by his side. Hmm. So does Pete, I'd think. For the love of God, please let that sweet little blonde girl get down here soon so he'll get off my ass and leave me be. <laughs> Mia. I was a mess flying down, but the second my plane touched down in Guadalajara, I told myself, if it's the last thing you do, you're going to be happy in this new country with your new life and the man of your dreams. There you go. Peter met me in the terminal with a dozen roses, and he whisked me off to Puerto Vallarta. For the first few days, I'd wait until Peter had fallen asleep, and then I'd cry, missing my parents and my brother and sister. I'd force myself to stop, telling myself, this is your new life, get used to it. I called my parents almost every day, as promised, and my dad would say, baby, if you're not happy, I'll go down there and get you. I'd pause and collect myself so he wouldn't hear my voice break. Oh, Dad, don't be so overprotective. I'm fine. Don't worry about me. Liar. I didn't feel like it, though. Another week went by, and I still felt guilty. But day by day, finally, I became happier. And soon, I was so happy. The happiest I'd ever been in my life. When we settled into Peter's parents' pueblo in San Juan after a month, I felt like I was home. Olivia. Mia was like a butterfly who'd come out of her cocoon when she got to San Juan. When I first saw her, I was like, wow, you're so sweet and kind. You're exactly what Peter needs. Hopefully, some of that sweetness rubs off on him. Hmm. She just made such an impression on me. I finally had a woman besides Daniela and Junior's mom to talk to when Junior was working. And most important, she got Peter off my back. That man was in love. Like so in love that when he made her lunch, he'd cut hearts into her sandwich. I thought it was the cutest, sweetest gesture I- Dumb boys is hopeless romantics. We can only wish to be such hopeless romantics. Boy, we have happy women if that was the case. <laughs> or not. I'd ever seen. Mia. San Juan made me feel like there was a bigger world out there, and I was ready to tackle it head on. In the morning, I'd get up and a local fruit vendor would be at my front door asking me what kind of fruit I'd like for breakfast. I'd take my pick and he'd fix it. I remember thinking, wow, I actually know how to order something all by myself in Spanish. Since Peter was always so stressed out and busy because of work, I tried as hard as possible to bring out his fun side. I'd beg him to take me out for a drink. Only with you could I have the time of my life at a bar in the middle of nowhere, he'd laugh. Peter tried to take care of my every need all the time. He was so interested in protecting me, I honestly think he would have put me in a little bubble if he could have. But at the same time, he wanted to build me up and make me independent. Why don't you drive here? He once asked. And sure enough, 
I got to be brave enough to get behind the wheel of a car on those crazy roads. Olivia. Junior and Peter bought a ranch near their parents' place, and we all started to remodel it. I was sitting on top of the highest mountain outside of San Juan. So when you were winding down the road that went through town, you could look up and see this huge structure. It was a 10-bedroom, 10-bath house with a huge palapa, and it looked like a villa. We made an infinity pool that extended over the mountaintop with shooting fountains that looked like the Bellagio in Vegas. The whole thing was lit up with LED lighting, too, so you'd get the full effect. Jeez. We were so far up that, one time, Junior and I decided to make love right on top of the mountain. Of course you did. We didn't think that anyone would ever be able to see us, but sure enough, a pickup full of men passed by and started honking and screaming, Yeah, go. yeah! I jumped off Junior and squeezed in next to him, both of us laughing harder than we ever had in our lives. All they saw was a full moon with all that ass of yours, he said. I was so embarrassed because everyone in town knew whose ass it was. Mia. Junior and Pete built a basketball court they'd play on every night. Then they constructed this little zoo that had exotic animals like ostriches, monkeys. Boy, y'all was living the good life, the little, uh, the little Escobar life up there with your own little zoo and your smash spots with the wifey and the infinity pools, living a good life. It's toucans and other exotic birds. They even got a baby tiger at one point. In Mexico, that was just a thing you did if you had money. In the house, we had a rare blue mastiff named Kilo. He was huge and looked like a wrinkled up old sumo wrestler. Every time Olivia and I walked into the house and saw him lying there, it would scare the shit out of us. Peter was so into horses that he built 10 stables and filled them up. He bought a new horse every week, these gorgeous thoroughbreds. On the weekends, we traveled to different ranches to pick them out. A trainer exercised them every day and made their food from scratch. He'd dice up carrots perfectly and blend them with oats and vitamins to get them ready for the races. When the horses weren't competing, we'd ride them into the mountains. One night, Peter and I sat in front of the stables to watch them sleep. We grabbed a blanket and a bottle of tequila, sat under the stars, and stared at them for hours. Olivia. The property was so big, we had actual trails all over it. So when the horses weren't on them, we'd hop on our four-wheelers. People used to call us the Power Rangers because when we rode around, we all wore big helmets with dark shades covering our eyes and each person wearing a different colored suit, just like the Power Rangers. Junior wore black, Mia wore pink, Peter wore green, I wore red, Daniela wore blue, and Adrian wore gold, of that course. Was the Power Rangers for real. We'd suit up, drive down the mountain, miles and miles away into random towns nearby. And when we'd grab lunch, people would look at us like we were from another planet. Mia. Sticking out like a sore thumb. There were so few times we weren't all together. Peter's parents, Olivia and Junior, Adrian and Daniela, me and Peter. We were one big, happy family. There was so little to do in that town, so some nights we'd just sit with my in-laws in the plaza and talk to everyone. People were always drawn into long discussions with Peter. He'd sit for hours in the plaza and let the old men in town tell him stories. He sure loved it. Family was always visiting, too. Their sisters would come down and stay all summer, and Xavier, Samantha, and Sasha were down every single school break, including all summer. About a month after I got to San Juan, a relative brought down Peter's daughter, Sophia, for a visit. She was about to turn one, and Peter had asked me to help surprise her with a big birthday party. I'd never met her before, and I was actually kind of terrified, even though I was great with kids. Being a nurturer and taking care of children had become second nature to me. Still, I remember thinking, I've really got to prove myself here. This little girl may be my stepdaughter someday. 
I wanted everything to be perfect, so I got her dress custom-made and mapped out every little detail weeks in advance. I might as well have been planning a wedding for all the stress I felt. When we picked her up, I thought she was just a perfect little girl. I smiled at her, hugged her, and said, it's nice to meet you. She just stared at me and then snuggled into her papa's arms. She came down every few months after that, and I'd drop everything for her. We'd do finger paints while Peter worked, or I'd let her toddle out to see the horses. I was always looking for her acceptance, and she became my number one priority when she was with us. Olivia Outside our four walls, it was a different world. San Juan wasn't exactly the most prosperous place I'd ever been. Most people in Junior's dad's generation had helped their parents farm sugarcane and guayaba. But a water table shortage in the 80s and 90s caused farmers to replace these crops with agave, which brought in less money. In Mexico, there was no middle class. That meant there was us, the rich drug lords on the mountain, and them, the poor people in town. That didn't cause jealousy. If anything, Peter and Junior were like royalty because they kept that town running. They had people walking their horses, cooking, cleaning, tending the grounds, waxing their cars, mm -hmm. cleaning their pool, even taking care of the monkeys and the baby tiger. Capitalism. These people needed those jobs, and they were making good money. Everywhere else in Mexico, you'd get paid maybe $120 a week. Junior and Peter were giving them four times that. They had an open tab at the pharmacy for people who couldn't afford their medications. They kept a line of credit at the local furniture store, too, in case people needed a new bed or a crib for their new baby. They gave gifts to the poor kids on Christmas and food to the elderly. There was this beautiful little girl in town who needed surgery. They paid for her operation in the United States, as well as her family's plane fare and hotel bills while she was in the hospital. That generosity didn't go unnoticed, and sometimes it was taken all the wrong way. There aren't any factories in San Juan, so manufacturing jobs are non-existent. Most men leave for America, looking for work, so the town is 60% female. Sometimes mothers and fathers would hike up to the ranch, knock on our door, and say, please marry my daughter. Then they'd present their daughter to Junior and Peter, <laughs> right there on our doorstep. These girls were only teenagers, all of 15 or 16. Mia. Mexico. The differences were even more stark when their wholesalers and couriers would come into town. Peter and Junior had set up their Mexico-based operations after Peter crossed the border. In San Juan, they were closer to the source of the drugs they'd been trafficking. And because of that, they were growing. But since they couldn't be on the ground in the United States, they used Google Earth to help pick out new locations for warehouses and stash houses, then enlisted their legion of men and women on the ground in Chicago and throughout the Midwest to be their eyes and ears. They needed to see them frequently, so they'd fly them down to Mexico. A lot of their wholesalers were black, and they'd travel down with their girlfriends. The townspeople would just stare at them, their mouths open and their eyes following them as they drove through town. Most of them had never seen a black person in their life. I just took it all in and never asked any questions. I didn't think it was my business, and frankly, I didn't care. All I knew was I was becoming a different person in San Juan. I was seeing a world I'd never known. I loved going to the food stands in town and ordering things I'd never heard of. I couldn't wait to visit a new horse ranch on the weekend. And most of all, I was totally infatuated with Peter. And he felt the same about me. I forgot about everyone and everything back home. No one can touch us here in Mexico, I hmm. thought. Dumb. Unfortunately, I couldn't have been more wrong. Wrong like a mom. Everything eventually wears itself, out, wears itself out, gets sour. The hero dies young or lives long enough to see himself become the villain. You know, you be in that town, they love you one minute, next minute, they're trying to lynch you. Um, what did we learn in this episode? We learned that Peter and Val had a contentious relationship. 
They were constantly picking at each other. Uh, we learned Val wasn't going to take a sit-down approach to no, none of the men in the family, not the father, not the brother, not nobody. We learned that Vivi had a choice to make, and she made her choice. You know what I'm saying? She made her choice, and she went to Mexico, and that was a crossroads moment. But look at all the good that they did for that town, you know? That's, that's dope shit. Like, the dope shit is having the line of credit open for people who need furniture or having an open account at the pharmacy for people that need medication. If you got it, why not? 